welcome to Going Global. This is a webinar series designed by EDEA and Science Park and EDEA Innovation, the most exciting innovation hub and leading tech incubator here in Sweden. And the goal of this webinar is to help your business have a successful global expansion. Right now, we're live streaming in Lund. I am Jenny Liang. I am originally from China, but I've studied and worked in Asia, South America, and Europe. Currently, I am the CEO of Squangnet Startup, a startup community building organization based in Malmö, and I work to support local tech founders. And the, I'm so excited to be the moderator for you today, and I will guide you through today's session. And in the next two hours, we're speaking about Asia. For many Nordic tech entrepreneurs, Asia seems to be a remote and uh, uh, unfamiliar market because of different languages and the culture barriers. And yet it is a market for 4.5 billion people. This is a market every business pays close attention to. And joining us today, we have a group of expert panelists from Hong Kong, Singapore, and Japan. And they will share with you um, what they do and how they can support you to expand your business to Asia. Dear audience, I know you have lots of questions. Write down, write down them in the chat and we will try our best to answer those questions. So now let's dive into the discussion and we'll start uh, with Hong Kong. And we have uh, Linda Brandley from Business Sweden, Max Girl from Invest Hong Kong, and the Bing Johansson from Nordic Innovation House Hong Kong. And then we'll hear one testimonial from Inning Wang of uh, the Nordic, uh, Nordic Asia Group. Um, Linda, you have uh, decades of experiences working with tech companies. Um, we are so happy to have you here today and feel, ready to, uh, feel free to start your presentation now. Thank you, Miss Moderator. I'm very happy to join this conference and webinar today. Uh, I'm in Hong Kong and I just had some nice dim sum lunch, so I'm, I'm quite uh, in a good mood here. Um, and I made a presentation, so I will uh, share my slides here. Uh, so I'm here invited to talk about Hong Kong, but I also, of course, added the Greater Bay Area uh, to put Hong Kong in a perspective. Uh, and just a short reference about my experience. I've been doing business here for the past 15 years, uh, mostly around in the Asian markets. And I landed eventually in Hong Kong. Uh, and it's also because I feel Hong Kong is a very good hub to reach multiple markets, especially in Northeast Asia. Um, I thought I would give you a glance first about the Greater Bay Area region. Uh, then uh, I would talk about the economic situation out here and especially also a little bit uh, politicalized uh, lately due to the new introduction of the security law here. Um, opportunities for your company. Uh, and uh, diving right into the presentation. Um, I'm not sure how much knowledge you have about this uh, part of China. Uh, but it's the most southern province, uh, Guangdong province, and uh, it's about uh, approximately 70 million people living here. Uh, Hong Kong is, of course, a large city, but there are other large cities. So it's Guangzhou and Shenzhen, who is most famous, but actually there are nine cities in the whole Guangdong province. Um, and um, I think overall it's... Uh, um, Per capita GDP is about half of Sweden, but it's picking up very rapidly. And there are even uh, factories now that are being relocated to other parts of China because actually the price of uh, uh, skilled workers and et cetera is going up. Uh, so we see more and more of a development in the Bay Area that actually is becoming a bit like in Silicon Valley. Uh, and my next slide is showing you that the mature areas of Silicon Valley, New York City, and the greater Tokyo area, I'm sure you're going to hear about it later today, is actually um, great. The Bay Area is picking up and becoming a larger and larger player. And in 2030, it's expected to be the largest one. Uh, so it's really a part of the world that everyone should be watching. 
Um, if we look into Hong Kong, um, I think quite interesting to notice that it's a very big uh, service economy. And to put it in perspective to the Swedish economy, I think Sweden has about 70% services. Uh, in Hong Kong, it's 90% services. Um, and the services rank from trading and logistics, from financial services, a very big banking sector, uh, professional services, tourism. And lately, uh, there is a huge drive to, to try to be a more innovative economy. So this is particularly interesting for the Swedish companies uh, looking to expand into this region. Is that innovation, there's lots of programs to tap into. Uh, and being from the Nordic Innovation House, we'll talk about this later on as well. So the industrial part of Hong Kong has more or less uh, shrank year by year and is moving out of Hong Kong. So this is really a, a service city. Um, just to shake everyone up and see if you read the latest news, um, this is Oatly, a very famous Swedish company. Uh, they actually got introduced the day before yesterday on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange, um, together with the New York Exchange. And it's quite historical that they didn't just go to New York, that they actually went to Hong Kong at the same time. And I think this shows a bit how the world is being developed now more and more to uh, that to, to sort of balance the, the US-China relations, more and more companies are looking also to find capital in this side uh, and the Hong Kong Stock Exchange being more and more interesting to raise capital. Uh, so looking at the economic situation and how it impacts your company. I think first, interesting to notice we are uh, on a regular basis once per year we're doing a business climate survey here so we talk to all the companies that are present so there are 200 Swedish companies in Hong Kong doing business at the moment um, and we have talked to them uh, actually it's a survey result coming out now for 2021 it has not yet been published uh, so I will show you the figures of uh, the 2020 survey but approximately the picture is the same. Uh, so we have uh, uh, a lot of small companies being established here, uh, some medium sized and some larger companies with employees over a thousand. Um, and the main sector, I think it's clear that it's a service driven economy. So a lot within professional services, uh, in consumer services, uh, some in industrial services. And in terms of uh, presence in Hong Kong, um, there are um, quite a few experienced, mature companies that have been here over 20 years. Um, there is a um, few that has been here maybe around 10 years and uh, a fair percentage of newcomers. But newcomers are more and more welcome. So I think that's uh, part of, of the focus of the seminar here. Um, Looking at uh, the national security law and how it has affected the business climate. Uh, this is, uh, could be a webinar itself to talk about uh, what's going on in Hong Kong. Um, I think for me moving out here, it was quite clear that a lot of the things you read about in the Swedish media is, is very black and white. And when you come here, you see that there are some parts that is easier to sort of get the balanced perspective. Um, and in fact, the, the basic things about Hong Kong still remains, that it is a, a very low tax corporate uh, environment. It's a free trade zone. It's uh, zero customs. There is a free access to capital. And uh, it remains even more a gateway to China. Uh, so these facts remains. Um, but there is a worry among, of course, a lot of the, the foreign companies here that what will eventually happen in Hong Kong. And uh, if you ask them, which we did also, what is the business impact that you expect from the new security uh, law? Um, there is a few of them that are on the negative side. Um, and uh, some of them can't really tell. They're sort of... Uh, Yes, we don't know, but uh, uh, 
Uh, and actually also interesting to notice that there are a few of them that has been positive. And the way we understand that is that we don't have the social unrest that used to be uh, part of the Hong Kong scene uh, a few years back. Uh, so there is some worry, uh, of course, uh, but nothing that has so far uh, made the companies feel, feel that they cannot do their business. And the result for the new study coming out now shows that over 77% of the companies have been profitable even during the COVID times. Uh, so it means that the business impact is, is not there, but the worry is there. Um, and moving on, um, I think to talk about Hong Kong without mentioning the greater region is uh, uh, it's impossible. So most companies that are out here are doing business outside Hong Kong as well almost 90%, so it's a large portion. Uh, and if you see where Hong Kong is located, you can see that it's very easy to reach uh, the northern part of China, uh, but it's also uh, quite easy to reach uh, Vietnam, which is becoming a big hub, especially for people uh, or for, for companies that have been diversifying their uh, uh, supplier network. And they are looking to maybe not just to produce in China, but also to produce in other parts of Asia. Um, and then uh, looking into more of uh, uh, also neighboring markets like Singapore, Indonesia, Japan, and Taiwan is also part of the markets where Hong Kong companies tend to do business. Uh, so it has been a hub for many companies, and it still is a hub. Um, although Asia is uh, developing quite quickly, so it's hard to have this one hub to reach the whole of Asia. But this is definitely a hub to reach uh, into mainland China and to the east part of Asia. Um, so coming back to the opportunities for your company coming to Hong Kong. Um, I think uh, it's good to mention what the Swedish brands stand for here. And, um, it has a very good reputation uh, and Swedish brand is associated with uh, quality, it's associated with trust, sustainability, design, safety and innovation. Uh, so all these aspects are, are favorable and something that should be part of your um, communication to the market here. Uh, I was asked, I think this picture is not very nice to look at, but uh, I was asked to pinpoint what are the concrete opportunities that we see out here and where are we doing projects together with Swedish companies. Um, and we see that there is a huge potential within the energy and real estate sector here. Uh, there is a will from Hong Kong government side to clearly work on their climate action plan. Uh, and they have set a target to reduce the energy intensity by 40% already 2025. Uh, and they have also made a green fund in order to sponsor this uh, refurbishment of a lot of the houses. Uh, so um, energy conservation and efficiency, if you do have a, a company working with this area, I think this is highly relevant for Hong Kong. Um, another big initiative is, of course, to electrify and make uh, more fossil fuel uh, mobility and uh, city car uh, landscape. Uh, and this is a roadmap stretching all the way from uh, yeah, 2035 to 2050. Um, so it's a longer roadmap, but of course, looking at public transportation, it's needed to start this roadmap uh, implementation already now. Um, and another uh, very interesting uh, opportunity here is uh, waste collection and recycling. Uh, so I think if you're inside any of these areas, uh, it's, uh, it's an interesting uh, market for you. Uh, also within the healthcare, 
industry. Um, there is a big refurbishment going on in terms of hospitals and also building new hospitals. And there are 11 hospitals that are under either reconstruction or new build. Uh, it's a rapidly aging society equal to other Asian markets, in particular Japan. Uh, so the elderly care uh, is a focus. And being in a market where you have, uh, I think, the most mutual funds and, uh, and a huge banking sector, it's impossible not to mention the possibilities within uh, uh, the financial technology sector. Um, so this is also an interesting area. Uh, and the digitalization overall of society, there is a smart city blueprint equal to the one that is derived in, in China uh, to look at. And if you have educational uh, technology companies, also the focus area. Um, another big sector here is uh, retail and experiences. Um, there's a very high purchasing power and uh, e-com sector has been actually quite slow if you compare it to other Asian markets. And the reason is that the city is so compact, so people have been able to, to, to purchase and go out and get whatever they desire. Uh, but now because of COVID, there has been a, a quite a boom in the e-com sector. Um, and it's a good starting point also to take your concept into other Asian markets and especially the mainland China. So if you have something looking at into e-com or online payments, healthy organic food, um, lifestyle and design concept, as well as gaming is, is interesting here in Hong Kong. Um, shortly, uh, what can we do at Business Sweden to support you? So we are working in three different uh, areas. Uh, we are working with uh, laying out your market expansion plan. So it means that we are um, supporting you in deciding, okay, which market should I go to? And if you have decided on, okay, it's really Hong Kong or Greater Bay Area that I want to reach, then we go further and looking at which segments and to whom so should I offer uh, my solutions. Linda, uh, thank you so much for the presentation. Yeah. Um, yes, this is uh, super exciting. And the, mm -hmm. we will move on to our next uh, agenda, Matt from Invest Hong Kong. Thank you. Yes, so good. Now, now we have Linda's contact information. Um, you guys feel free to reach out to her. Th thank Matt, you so much. Yeah, thanks so much. I just... Uh start to share my screen here uh yes there we are thank you so much uh, hopefully you see the screen here uh, yes my name is Mats Gerlam I'm working for uh, Invest Hong Kong uh, here in Sweden and I'm based in Gothenburg so it's just two and a half hours uh, north of of uh, Lund and I will do my presentation it will be a little bit about Hong Kong. Uh, some slides, a lot of slides here, but some slides is the same uh, as uh, uh, Linda talked about. So I just uh, uh, swipe through it and you will have this presentation afterwards also. Uh, and I will talk a little bit about Hong Kong. And as Linda said, you know, this is the key uh, advantage or the selling point for Hong Kong is the location. You know, it's 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 perfectly located in Asia. Uh, you have half of the world population within a five-hour flight, uh, and Hong Kong is part of of China, but still, it's another system. It's uh, uh, since '97 when it was uh, UK uh, left back to China. It it is it's another system with a, a free uh, currency. The Hong Kong dollar is fully transferable to all different uh, currencies. Uh, free flow information, free press, etc. Uh, so in Hong Kong, you can uh, use Facebook, which we can't do on the other side of the border. Uh, and some of the advantages with Hong Kong is uh, the very competitive uh, tax system. You can say that. In principle, there is no taxes there. VAT zero, uh, capital gain, etc., is zero. No wine duty zero. 
and the main uh, is actually just two taxes is the corporate tax of of 16.5 percent uh, and which is for the first uh, two million in profit hong kong dollar hong kong dollar is, is similar to swedish krona so for the two first million you uh, have, have profit tax and then the personal tax is just 15 percent which is is very competitive compared with sweden uh, so it's a really competitive tax uh, system in hong kong but also it's a very vibrant uh, 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 business climate in hong kong and there are more than nine thousand uh, companies in hong kong has foreign uh, a mother company outside Hong Kong, uh, and also it's uh, over 1,500 companies in Hong Kong who has used Hong Kong as a regional hub because of the location, use Hong Kong as an Asia-Pacific uh, region, re region office. And here on the slide, you also see that major source of parent companies uh, and uh, Sweden is not here, but there are many Swedish and Nordic companies. Uh, one of the biggest actually uh, investors in Hong Kong is from the mainland, as as China is uh, it's a one country two systems. So the actually biggest investor in Hong Kong is from the mainland, and then they are using Hong Kong as a hub to go international. Uh, and why? Uh, we do this annual survey every year and ask the, the companies, you know, why do you uh, establish in Hong Kong? And uh, the, the, the different reason, as I mentioned before, you have a very competitive uh, tax system and it's very simple. You know uh, how it works, but also it's, it's also international financial center with a free flow information. And it's extremely good in uh, communication, not just as I mentioned, I showed the map before. I showed that it's, it's you know, five hours, uh, you are uh, half of the world's population, but it's also very competitive and effective within Hong Kong. The, uh, it's just, uh, it's 7 million people in Hong Kong, as big as uh, Gotland, but it's very good with the MTR system which transfers millions of people every day. And it's very effective to also just go to Shenzhen or whatever. Uh, we, here is some kind of a business which, which uh, uh, different sectors who uh, do business in Hong Kong. And of course, in the financial service side, Hong Kong is one of the uh, biggest international financial centers in the world. So it's a lot of that, but also within uh, business professional service. It's it's a trade and logistic hub, so it's a lot of different sectors uh, from companies. Uh, and as we also now we 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 when I looked on the attendee list, uh, there's a lot of tech companies uh, listening here today, and also with the Ideon is is a lot of the startup and and tech companies. And uh, since I I've, I've been working with Hong Kong uh, since many years since 2003 actually and in those days the startup community was sort of a of course there were startup it was not that well known and it has developed a lot since then and uh last survey was over 3,000 startups in hong kong and employed more than 10,000 uh, employees and 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 invest hong kong which i work with we have been part of that development to help the ecosystems around this. And uh, there, there's not just uh, Hong Kongers or Hong Kong returnees, but actually more than one, one quarter of all the startups is actually uh, from abroad. And it can be, it can be, for example, a Swedish guy working for a big uh, Asian company or Hong Kong company, and then they they love Hong Kong and then they start their own company. So it's actually a Swede, a Swedish person who does a, a startup in Hong Kong. And if you talk about uh, different sectors, of course, uh, fintech is a big one. It's more than 600 fintech companies, but they're also in other 
uh, sectors uh, with, with uh, they come from. Uh, and especially when we talk about the fintech, there is an ecosystem called Fintech Hong Kong, uh, which is a, a network of fintech company. Uh, and the, the main reason why a, a companies come within the fintech as they use Hong Kong is of course to attract the Asian market, but also a lot of uh, companies do for finance and do IPOs in Hong Kong. Uh, and an event which I can also uh, mention uh, and uh, is a Start Me Up uh, HK Festival, which take place this summer. Uh, last year, it was virtual for the first time and it will be virtual this time also. And it's a good networking event where you uh, attending this event, you are happy to, to attend here. It's a lot of attendees. It's an interesting program. Uh, it's a good matchmaking uh, opportunity to meet different companies, but also there is also interesting to uh, connect with investors if you are uh, in, in the fundraising mode. So it's because it's, uh, as I said, Hong Kong is an international financial center. There's a lot of VCs, there's a lot of money in Hong Kong. Uh, another event, which uh, I think also Bin will mention, is the Hong Kong FinTech Week, which takes place later this year. Uh, it's a similar event, uh, but it's focusing on FinTech. It uh, will be virtual, maybe it will be a little bit physical, but it's, also, it's a great program. It's a good networking. You could do matchmaking, and it's a good uh, also to connect with uh, investors. And then uh, Invest Hong Kong, we are a government agency. Uh, we don't invest in companies. We don't have money. We help companies. But there are different uh, government funding schemes and support in Hong Kong. And this is just some examples uh, in different phases where you are. When you set up the company, there are different incubation programs, VC programs. But then there are also a lot of R&D uh, programs in Hong Kong Science Park. You can get fundings. And then through hiring and business development and expansion. So, there. so please come back to us uh, or me, and then we can guide you, uh, you know, how, how you can find the, the funding. Linda mentioned this also, uh, Greater Bay Area. Uh, Hong Kong is 7 million people. It's, it's uh, larger as Gotland. The Greater Bay Area is 10 times bigger. Is, is big, uh, the, the size is like uh, Ireland, uh, and, but the GDP is like Australia or Spain. So it's a substantial business. Uh, also mentioned this, uh, it's a good Hong Kong. Uh, is uh, You have the bridge, which is already open over to Shuohan and Macau, but you can actually take uh, the, the fast train up to Shenzhen to the border and all the way up to, to Guangzhou South, which takes just 48 minutes. Uh, so it, it's, a, it's a vibrant area. This is just also which, which Linda mentioned. It's a substantial people-wise, GDP-wise, and this is just to show the comparison with uh, San Francisco Bay Area, which is maybe the most well-known with Tokyo Bay Area. So it, it's... Uh, and. And then uh, quickly, uh, a little about, about Hong Kong, Invest Hong Kong. Uh, we are government agency, as I mentioned. We can help you through the planning, setup, launch, and aftercare so, uh, side. And we help with contacts, information, so whatever. How does it work? How much does it cost? How can I start a company? How can I uh, recruit people? Finding an office, a visa. Uh, international schools, we try to help you and we can also help with some PR, etc. Uh, we have different uh, sectors within the headquarter. I'm based in, in, in Sweden, but then we have sector specialists in different uh, areas in, in headquarter who can know more about different details there. And here is a little bit about organizations. Uh, I'm covering and the Nordics, uh, and I have a colleague here, is, is actually taking care of Norway and Denmark. We work together. 
And here is my contact details. I'm close by. Uh, I'm uh, two and a half hours drive from Lund, so I can come down and visit you, or we can have a Zoom call, or you can come and you're welcome to visit me here in Gothenburg also. So, yeah, thank you so much. Hello, this is Pin Johansson from the Nordic Innovation House in Hong Kong. Okay, so this is Nordic Innovation House Hong Kong, and uh, for us, it is five countries and one mission. So uh, the, what we do is scaling the best of the Nordics. We are the internationalization arms for all uh, tech startups, scale up and um, uh, growth companies. As Matt and Linda already said, I am uh, ha handling the uh, Greater Bay Area. Uh, and I try to land you first in Hong Kong with all the benefits that Hong Kong give, uh, as Matt Gallam said from uh, his presentation. Uh, when you have a stop in Hong Kong, you basically have a, a stop for the whole Asia, not only Greater Bay Area and China. So for me, it is, um, I only am very modest, only working with the Greater Bay Area with 71 million in population, and we are the biggest Bay Area. If you've seen the presentation, we beat Tokyo, San Francisco, and New York Bay Areas. And uh, I think that Tokyo will have something to say about it later on on their presentation. So who are we? The Nordic Innovation House, it's, uh, I have five houses globally, started in Silicon Valley 2014 and all the way to Tokyo last year. Hong Kong and Singapore was up in 2018. So uh, what do we do? We are um, funded I, and um, supported by the uh, Council of Ministries, of Nor Nordic Council of Ministries. And uh, the funding partner is Nordic Innovation. The operating partner here, here in Asian houses is Business Sweden, and we work with the embassies, the consulates, and all the other trade promotional offices. Uh, so I'm going to dive directly into what kind of um, programs and anchor events that Hong Kong has to offer, uh, because um, the presentation of Hong Kong and uh, by Linda and by Matt, it's quite clear. There is a lot of fundings, a lot of opportunities, and a lot of um, uh, Nordic text that is needed in this area. So for me, I'm doing three, uh, I'm r running three events and within these events, I also run programs uh, and all my events happens to do, uh, happen in November. So Matt already mentioned the Hong Kong FinTech Week, which is, which makes sense uh, due to we are actually the biggest, one of the biggest financial hub in the world. And then China High Tech Fair in Shenzhen, uh, and Gerontech, the elderly care and uh, handicapped care. So, uh, because of the, yeah? Can you hear us? Someone tried to ask something? Yes, we can hear you. Hear you. Okay. Hear you. Good. Um, and um, just going back uh, to the um, market entry programs that we have. The Hong Kong programs have three components. We have uh, some of the components totally free and uh, information is available. You can follow the information program or whatever, whatever from uh, by tapping into my LinkedIn or following the Nordic Innovation Houses or uh, actually subscribe to our newsletter. And Matt and other Invest Hong Kong is also here to help. So the program um, for all the programs and events, we have the program partners if we, with introduction webinars, business and technology matchmakings, partners, clients and investors. So this is the free part. You just need to uh, follow the different events and find and, and make sure that you are tapped into the deadlines because everything that is free means that you have to apply and follow deadlines and it's a competition. You can win cash prices, everything from 100,000 US dollar up to 200,000 US dollar, depends on what industry you're in. So for the Nordic Innovation House part, we all have the same kind of structure here, the, the Asian houses. We have a 12 month membership fee. If you are a member of the house, then you are automatically tapped into all my uh, networks here. And then with the trade promotion officers, they have more hands-on help. Like they can help you to showcase opportunities, just like Linda mentioned before. And they also help to customize individual meeting program together with the house. And uh, for the paying part, uh, you also get a full, uh, you also get the membership of the house automatically. And uh, with all the support for the 12 next month, it's a full year membership. So I'm going to dive directly into the China High Tech Fair, who is hosted in Shenzhen this year between the 17th and 
to 21 November. Uh, and um, in the uh, 2019, before the pandemic, we have uh, normally, it's like a physical, we have like um, a booth where it's your anchor point in Shenzhen. And then there is a lot of side programs around this. And you can showcase your uh, technology and you meet with investors, meet with sellers, meet with buyers, meet with um, partners. And you can also have opportunity to visit uh, big corporations around Greater Bay Area, like uh, Tencent, DJI, and that kind of companies. So this is the uh, last year's categories, and I think it will be quite the same. So for the companies around in Ideon and Scarra Games Corner, um, have a look at the clean tech sector, environment protection, uh, advanced manufacturing, ICT, IT, and uh, big data, cloud computing, smart city. Basically, the China High Tech Fair is the number one tech fair in China. Uh, in, in China. So uh, I'm, right now we maybe have competition with uh, Shanghai, but it's not exactly the same kind of fair. So it depends on how you compete or how you measure it. Uh, so this is last year, uh, even though it is um, hybrid format, uh, the, China, the, the companies that's already in China still have a physical meeting. So this year will be the same. So this is the exhibitors last year in 2020, uh, while the international, the whole international ar uh, area arena was gone, of course, because no one can fly anywhere. Uh, so the Nordic Innovation House have a virtual pavilion. I think we were based in the next, ne near to the 2F, um, if you're interested in the virtual side. But uh, well, so for us last year, Loop is one of the Swedish companies that actually uh, was presented and um, highlighted for the fair. So the free part of China High Tech Fair is my partner, Nordic China Startup Forum, already have kicked off their company search. They, uh, this group is a little bit bigger. They work with whole China. They have, they, they have a full program for uh, North, South, West, and East. So basically, I'm handling the South part of this program. Uh, everything is free uh, because uh, they are supported by the uh, Chinese government and also by the Swedish Nordic Apiary Group. So they already kick up. This is a timeline. So for you guys who are interested in joining the program that NCSF uh, is uh, providing, and if you join this program and get selected as the 25, uh, as, as the company uh, coming together with the program, then the South part, the China High Tech Fair is automatically included free of charge. So please um, register today and start the journey with them. They also offer you some pitch sessions to make it easier for them to choose companies. So as you can see, the pitching session already started in Uppsala. And for Stockholm and the Gothenburg Malmö, Stockholm is in the May 20 and Gothenburg Malmö is June 10, which is actually the last pitching sessions. The selection of companies will be done in during June and it will be announced by the uh, beginning of July. So again, um, uh, the, I'm a partner of this group, so if you get chosen by them, everything for you uh, for the China High Tech Fair is free. Uh, Matt will get the full uh, sales pitch marketing material for me later for all my three different um, events that I'm going to uh, do. Uh, the other one is Gerontech. Uh, the elder care. This is not free. This is not really for startups either. This is for more mature company who actually have a product to sell because this is more a selling opportunity than a um, uh, like a pitching session. So different program with different um, um, opportunities. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing now because um, I have more information, but I think most interesting for you is just to contact me uh, and uh, or contact Matt for a lot more of this kind of program. And the same thing with Business Sweden, they will also um, have the full information of the more detailed programs. Yeah. Uh, so to save time, I will just say thank you for me and ask questions and we'll try to answer them later. Yeah, Bing, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, I think we resolved the technical issue and we would like to show uh, the audience the video. Ah, oh, okay. A two-minute video, and then and Yining can talk more about the house because he is one of my uh, member, and I'm really proud of Yining's achievement. So let's start the video if you still have it. Yes, let's do that.
we will start a we'll we'll move on next to Yining Wang. Uh, feel free to start your presentation. Very good. Uh, thank you, everybody, and very happy to be here today to share a little bit more experiments from a more practical point of view. Because uh, I'm a founder and a startup manager right now, and I've worked actually quite a long time, both with Sweden and in, in Asia before starting my journey as Nordic Asia Investment Group. So firstly, what I will do is speak a little bit of my background and then a bit more around what we do at Nordic Asia Investment Group. And then finally, I will share some lessons because I looked at the uh, uh, participant list, I can see that quite a lot of you are entrepreneurs or business people and you want to do serious business. So I think with all the experience I've had both operationally and also here in the startup environment that I can help you a little bit with some of key insights and key lessons I've learned through managing a, you can say, a global business where you have a two point business, one business here in Sweden and also one point, point of business in Shanghai and Hong Kong. So first of all, a little bit around my own personal background. So my name is Yining Wang and I'm actually Swedish Chinese background. So I, my parents are from China, but I'm born and I'm raised here in Sweden. Uh, before I moved to uh, Hong Kong, I used to be the poor Lex cub, you can say management trainee at Melka Scharling AB. And Melka Scharling AB for most of the Swedish entrepreneurs is a very famous you can say entrepreneur and owner, and he's a big owner of Hexagon, Asabloy, and those kind of big multinational companies. In 2014, I actually moved down to Hong Kong to be the business manager for Asabloy uh, business segment, uh, covering all of APAC with more than 50% of our sales base in China. So before I started Nordic Asia Investment Group, I actually worked operationally in China uh, for more than six years and we managed a business over 250 employees. So I had quite a lot of operational business uh, uh, experience before founding my own company. So a little bit around what we do here at Nordic Asia. So I will share my screen here to you. So what Nordic Asia is, is actually we're taking the, the Swedish investment group, the investment company model uh, but we apply that for a growing consumer oriented companies in Asia and especially focus on China. So you can say a little bit that our aim here for Nordic Asia Investment Group is to become a new Shinavik or a new MSAB, Melka Scharling AB, but focused on the Chinese digital consumer companies. So our goal is to have a concentrated portfolio around 20 companies of which half of them we would like to be able to invest and identify the new Alibabas of China and uh, of Asia. And if you look a little bit of our business and why do we do this? Why are we relevant in this particular market? Is that if you look into a pure Swedish perspective, in Sweden, we have a very big financial market, but the Swedish investors are very under allocated towards China and in Asia. So if you look into the Swedish market of all total AUM, all assets under management, only half, of, half percent of that is allocated to China focused investment funds. And with the growth of China and growth of Asia that you can see today, this allocation of 0.5% is a very low percentage uh, compared to the size of the nation and the size of the opportunity that we see locally. So this is a problem. And I think, why is this problem persisting? And one of the key reasons for why this problem persists is that there are no real actors in the market who can perform, who can really help Nordic investors build a bridge directly into the China ecosystem. And that is why doing a global business makes sense. Because if I would be a Swedish person and offering Swedish investor a Swedish product, I am not unique. If I, I am a Chinese uh, investor and I offer Chinese investor a Chinese product, I am not unique. But if I am a Swedish investor and I offer Chinese investment opportunities, or I'm a Chinese investor and offer them Swedish investment opportunities, then I am unique. And I think uh, for many entrepreneurs who think about going global, need to understand what's the rationale 
for you to go global? Is it that you want to take your products, the Nordic product, to the Chinese market? Is it that you want to take Chinese products to the Swedish market? And by finding these, you can say, <laughs> these gaps in the global ecosystem, the bridges that has not been built before, I think you have opportunity there, similar to what we have. Now, how do you succeed doing this from a more practical perspective? So I wanted to show you a little bit on this part of the side. So for us, what we do, except for uh, the team we have here and the team we have in Hong Kong, et cetera, et cetera, uh, we're quite well established already. And we are actually planning for a pre-IPO right now and then an IPO later this year. But the key that we actually do is that we build this bridge between the Nordic and China for financial products, financial products. But how do you really make it work? Because it, it sounds very good, but how do you really make it work? And that is where I think some of the key lessons that I learned over these couple of years is that it, for us, when we are building this financial highway bridge, one side of this is that we need to understand very, very well, how does the Nordic market work? At the same time, we need to understand very, very well, how does the Chinese market work? And then in between, in between, by building this financial hybrid bridge, we need to see how do we fit this bridge in the middle so that what we do in Asia fits with what we do in Sweden and vice versa. And the key competence to be understanding how to build this bridge, then over time, you can make your product very unique, is that you have to be 100% local in both countries which means you have to really be very strong here in Sweden, which I bet you are, because most of you are Swedish companies, but at the same time, you have to be very strong in China or in Asia. It doesn't matter if you do sales or if you have purchasing or manufacturing, you need to have local market presence in China. So it doesn't mean that, you know, if you want to go global now, that you can go to Hong Kong one time you go to Shenzhen one time, you do some first, that's not gonna be enough for you, unfortunately. You really need to be locally present. You really need to have a person who can meet your investors there, speak to them and build your network locally. And you really need to invest locally if you want to be successful. So for us in Nordic Asia, I am my partner here. I am the partner here in Sweden, but I also have a very strong co-founder of my company based in Shanghai who has built up our Shanghai office. And, I, uh, and we also have an office here in Hong Kong. But it is extremely crucial for you to have people in place and you have to trust these people. You need to really find these people who are locally in both areas. And you as an entrepreneur, as a CEO, you need to be neutral. You need to be able to understand both parts because if you wanna go global and you are the CEO of this company and you don't get this right, then you will not succeed. So really some of the key insights that we have had through our journey so far is that if you want to go global, there are a lot of global opportunity, especially between the Nordics and China. There's a lot of new bridges, except for just the financial high bridge, great bridge. There are many other bridges that are to be built. And if you build each of these bridges, you will become very relevant. And there's a huge market opportunity for you. But the biggest challenge is how to build this bridge right. And to do this, you really need to be strong in Sweden. You need to be very strong in China as well. Find yourself a strong local partner that you can trust, you can work with. And also from your side, if you are going to build this bridge, you need to be able to understand both cultures and be understand and open-minded around how do they do business there that will work here and make sure that you understand how to calibrate this bridge. If you're leaning too much here, it will not be a fit. If you lean too much here, it will not be a fit either. So you have to be very delicate and humble around that process to understand exactly how this will be fit nicely and accept uh, uh, new challenges and new norms that can actually be very helpful for you to be able to make this bridge successful. Yining, thank you so much for uh, the suggestions. Localization is definitely the key to success. And the, right now, we will move on to another exciting market, Singapore. And the, for the Singapore market, we have uh, Markus Kusenen, uh, 
uh, are you with us, Marcus? Yes, absolutely. I'm, I'm with you guys. Yes. Uh, Marcus is a senior project manager at the Business Sweden, and feel free to start your presentation. Absolutely. Just give me one second here, and I will share my screen here. Good. Can you can you see it now? Yes. Perfect. But then let's start. So yeah, uh, as mentioned, my, my name is uh, Marcus Kusen, and I'm based here in Singapore since. Four, four years back. Um, so my role here in, in Business Sweden is uh, that I am the, the startup and scale up lead here in, uh, in Southeast Asia, where we are uh, 40 people actually today. Uh, so I will tell you a little bit more today. We have only 10 minutes here, so it's a, it's a lot of stuff to cover. So I will keep it quite high, high level, but please feel free to reach out to me afterwards if you want to know more, more details about anything that I am uh, presenting here today. But I will just start off uh, a little bit about business Sweden. Uh, I know Linda was presenting here before, but so I can just highlight very quickly that we have a quite strong presence uh, around in, uh, in APAC. Uh, we have uh, 50 different offices. Uh, and here in Singapore, uh, we are mainly, I would say, focusing on uh, Southeast Asia. But what we can see from our companies, which I will come back to, is that many, especially the small startups, they have kind of an APAC perspective uh, from, from Singapore. Uh, and an ex example uh, I can just tell you about for, uh, if you look at our operations here, like six years ago, we were only one person in Singapore. Now we are 11 people uh, and we are actually kind of the, the third biggest office uh, of business winners offices here in, in terms of revenue in South, Southeast Asia now. So that also shows a little bit where the, the focus has uh, shifted towards the Swedish companies that we see a huge inflow of Swedish companies that want to establish themselves, and especially a lot of SMEs and, and startups now uh, lately. Uh, but if I just start off a little bit about Singapore, so the small country in, in, in Southeast Asia. So uh, many of you have probably been here uh, for, for, for a trip uh, or on the way to Australia or Bali or whatever. Uh, so in Singapore today, it live, it's approximately 5.3 million, 5.5 million. Uh, and a large part of the population are, uh, are foreigners here. So it's uh, approximately 2 million that are from, uh, from, from other countries. So it's a, uh, it's a very kind of global, uh, global country. Uh, and, and what makes it good for, for many reasons is that uh, everybody speaks English really, really well here. Um, and as I heard from Hong Kong here as well, they, they did a comparison with Gotland. So in Singapore, we do the comparison with Erland instead. So it's uh, half the size of, of Erland. So it's uh, from the central part of Singapore, it takes approximately 30 minutes to go to, to any, any place in the, in, the, in the country. But it's, uh, it's a very rich country. Uh, so it's depending on the, what measure you look at, but somewhere around like the third uh, largest when it comes to GDP per capita. So it's, it's a country that's doing really, really well. If you look back in the 60s, uh, Singapore had approximately 25% of, uh, of Swedish GDP per capita, but today it's as much, much higher. Uh, so if you look at just some high level measures, why Singapore is kind of one of the like main markets uh, to establish for companies today when they want to enter the first market, when they go into to APEC, uh, is that it's a very, very easy country to do business in. So it's always pops up in the top, Top three. I think currently it's uh, it's ranked the second place in, in the world uh, when it comes to ease of uh, doing business. Uh, it's a very kind of easy country when it comes to bureaucracy, etc. You can own 100% of a company. It's it's as similar to Hong Kong, very low uh, tax rates. Uh, it's a very kind of global crowd that is uh, is living in in Singapore, uh, and it's a lot of people uh, traveling in and out. So it's it's a lot of knowledge that sits. Uh, uh, within uh, within Singapore, and as well. So, if you look at kind of the the companies that we work with today here, and, and what, what they are using Singapore for, so of course Singapore is a, it, by itself it's a very small market, but it's very strategically located in uh, in in APAC. Uh, so, if you look at kind of the largest corporates, they tend to have Singapore as a Southeast Asia hub, or or covering kind of India or or Australia from from Singapore. But if you look at uh, as for for Greater Denda, will be speaking after me here today. Uh, they many of the small companies they're using Singapore to cover 
larger parts of uh, APAC actually. And, and that's because it's, it's, uh, it's a lot of good travel options from, from Singapore. Uh, and it's also very convenient to, to live in, in Singapore as well for, for, for many reasons. Um, and if you look at the kind of the startup scene in, in Southeast Asia today, it uh, was, was not that big, I would say like 10, 10 years ago. But if you look now at the last five years, it's been growing quite, quite rapidly. And, um, and you have probably, many of you have heard of this uh, uh, SPAC deals that have been happening now lately. Uh, so actually uh, Grab, which is uh, the, the Uber in, uh, in, in Southeast Asia, yes, did uh, uh, the largest one now, uh, a couple of weeks back here now. So, so the startup scene is, is, is growing from like, if you look at kind of the, the startups that have been created here, but it's, I would say what especially is growing is a lot of foreign startups that are setting up in, uh, in, in Singapore. So I have friends from all, all around the world that has been uh, setting up business with the only purpose of focusing on Southeast Asia, but also set up their, uh, their Asia office in, in, in Singapore. Uh, and if you look at the Singapore uh, ecosystem, yes, very briefly, it's uh, been growing, as I mentioned, quite rapidly in the in the in the last last years. So it's it's a lot of different options when it comes to kind of co-working spaces. A lot of different incubator uh, programs. Uh, I, I won't go into any details of this one because I know all of your companies are are interested in in different verticals, etc. But but it can just be good to know that there. It's the, Singapore is quite strong in very many of these different verticals that you do you operate in. Uh, and if you look in the investor landscape, which is a landscape that we have been uh, working quite a lot with, they are especially strong, I would say, in the, the seed and the series A stage. Not as strong when it, if you look at the later stages. Then you, you have to look at the really, really late stages because you have two very strong sovereign wealth funds here. But so we have cases where uh, Swedish uh, startups have received their seed or pre-series A funding here in the uh, in, in Singapore. And it's also what we see as well when you lo look at the larger corporates, a lot of them have increased their uh, presence here when it comes to their like regional headquarters, uh, et cetera. And a lot of global companies move even the global headquarters to Singapore for today as well. Um, I already mentioned this, I don't think we don't have that much time, but uh, I have more information if, if you would uh, like to look into that uh, uh, later. Um, and if you look at the Swedish, uh, kind of company scene here in, in Singapore. It's around like 300 companies uh, and it's, I would say, constantly uh, increasing. We have requests, uh, multiple requests every month now uh, for, for new smaller companies that want to expand to Asia and use like Singapore as the, uh, as the hub. It's, it is quite good like, like amount of Swedish uh, people that are living here as well. So it's around 2,500 as well. Uh, and we are working together with Singapore on a government level on, on, in multiple aspects, um, but it's been historically kind of within defense, but it's also within ed education, FinTech. We are working quite a lot within the mobility space today as well. So we have uh, just uh, signed an MOU as well within that space as well, where we collaborate with uh, this, the Singapore counterparties. Uh, so this slide here is just an um, example of some companies uh, that uh, we have been working with recently and this is only companies that have actually made the decision to set up an entity or that we have worked with so then the list is much longer if you look at kind of the, the number of companies that i have worked with like in the in the last year so i've been for instance working with 30 plus fintech companies and you see a lot of them uh, them here so so what we typically do with this uh, with the startups here is everything from helping them fund uh, find the uh, funding it's to find kind of the first CEO, it could be to decide the, which market in the region they should, should enter, et cetera. But this is just some, some example of companies that have actually decided to hire people here uh, that we have supported in their establishments, et cetera. Uh, we also have quite a vibrant scene when it comes to larger corporates. So, so these are just some examples of Swedish corporates that have actually set up like innovation centers, uh, have innovation collaborations in Singapore. So as you can see on this slide, you have many of the largest uh, corporates in, uh, in, in Sweden uh, that are investing quite heavily into innovation in different aspects here in, uh, in, in Singapore. So you have like Volvo, Scania, ABB, et cetera. Uh, so they've all invested money into different innovation projects, et cetera. So that's a, a very, very strong thing as well, which we, which we see as well with the startups uh, to yeah, collaborate. Thank you, Marcus. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Marcus, for the interesting presentation. Um, now we have uh, Johan. 
who is the head of uh, Southeast Asia from Greater Dan. And he will offer us some like practical guidance of how he set up his, his business in Southeast Asia. Uh, Johan, are you with us? Feel free to start your presentation. Perfect. I guess you can see and hear me now, right? Yes. Perfect. So first off, thank you very much for having me here. Uh, it's always nice to get the opportunity to talk about my company and what we do and what I do. I really like that. So I'm going to do my best to keep myself in the timeline here. So um, uh, I will speak a bit around who we are, Greater Dan, uh, and then go into more why we chose Singapore, how I use Singapore as a hub to expand our business here, and some other key findings and learnings that I've seen as well. Uh, so yeah, my name is John. As I said, I'm the head of Southeast Asia for Greater Dan. Uh, I've been living here now in Singapore for 1.5 years. Really, really love it so far. Uh, I was sent down here to open up our office and to expand our presence in the region here. We are a Swedish insure tech company. And the core of what we do is our AI that uh, provides completely new data on risk for motor insurance. So our primary customers are motor insurance cust uh, companies and mobility companies as well. So when it comes to the total potential market size for us, it's the amount of vehicles in a country or a region. So I think that's one of the first clear cut reasons of why I'm here in Singapore. The, I, okay, I can't remember the exact amount of vehicles we have here in Southeast Asia, but the number is huge. Um, so we work with the, the insurance company and they use our data and risk insight. And of course, insurance companies already tend to be quite big. So what, getting one insurance company as a customer, it's, it's quite big for us then we'd like to work with that customer and try to connect up as many of their customers as possible. So we work a bit B to B to C there. So uh, our strategy for each new market uh, that we go into is to find a suitable partner that we see that we can expand with and that we can grow with. Uh, for Southeast Asia and Singapore here, uh, around two years ago, we struck a deal with a company called MS First Capital, uh, which is part of this huge Japanese insurance company called MSIG. Um, and so with that deal, we decided to set up a office here. That's when I was sent down here um, to mainly be, be close to our first customer here, but also do our best to work with that customer to really grow further with that customer as well. And what is key, I think that Mark has mentioned this, but what is key with Singapore is that not everyone, but so many companies have their hubs here in Singapore for the Southeast Asia or APAC market. And the same was for, uh, for MSIG. They have their global digital hub here in Singapore and also their regional hub here, just generally for all types of insurance and business. So with that move of me moving down here to be closer to MSIG, they just really saw that as a, um, as a very positive move and they directly contacted me and wanted to explore more opportunities. So fast forward from where I was then to today, uh, with MSIG, I, ha I have now managed to enter two additional markets with them, so except of Singapore, uh, and also create four more new projects with them. So currently working with them in Vietnam as well with Lexus uh, and MSIG, and also working with them in Indonesia with, with a company called Coro, which is a really hot up and coming auto tech company here in Singapore. And it's more, more coming on the way here. Um, so when it comes to entering new markets from Singapore, at first, I thought it, it was going to be a much bigger hassle. Everything when it comes to contract signing, because you have different laws in different countries, when it comes to just invoicing, uh, when it, and this, especially uh, since we're a tech company, when it comes to data and privacy policies, for example, that's always something people ask about oh, how do you store your data and everything. And I was really shocked because that was, that was not a problem at all. Everything so far 
uh, has been going so smoothly on that part. So bureaucracy has not has not been uh, a sto showstopper for us. So um, just some key learnings uh, on why I think we've been successful so far. And from what I have seen is a good way to do business here. Uh, of course, it's different for each industry and type of company and everything. But of course, when you're out, because we're not a huge company, we're 30 people. Um, most of them works in our head office in Stockholm and I work here alone in Singapore. So starting to work with these companies like MSIG, you have to, you have to create a lot of trust with them. Um, and I saw that me just being here close with them, working with them, almost meeting them daily for some times um, really helped that part. And they really gained their trust with us. Um, other than that, uh, I see that uh, doing business with the companies here, uh, it's very, because we has, have a, as a strategy to refer to our part, uh, customers as partners, because we really see that we do not just want to sell something and then say buy and go to the next one. We rather work more closely, more in depth with one large company and try to expand that relationship as big as possible, trying to create as much value for both parties as well. And that has been very, very well received here. Um, very, yeah. So uh, other than that, so other than just MSIG, which is my main partner here, when it comes to getting new business here, um, I've seen that companies in this region are very, very curious for uh, uh, foreign tech and especially Swedish tech as well. Uh, I've seen that uh, saying you're a Swedish fintech or Swedish tech company clings very well. I think we have a lot of very prominent Swedish tech companies to thank for that, to making that a good brand. So, um, Pre-COVID, I'd say there was at least one networking event per week that really, really fit me. So what I did was just try to attend every one of them, just trying to do good old fashioned networking. And the people are really open, really curious, want to learn more, even if they're from huge uh, corporations. Most of the times they're really happy to take a meeting. And from there, I've been, I've been, managed to just uh, grow my business um, from that. Uh, before COVID, I was traveling maybe once every second week. So it was mainly to Bangkok, to KL as well, uh, to Japan as well. And um, it's all thanks to that, just networking, being here in Singapore, being able to be in Bangkok in three hours, for example. Um, and then, just to uh, finalize as well, um, when it comes to setting up our business here, that's, uh, that was part of my responsibility as well, to set up our business here and um, uh, fix all that legal and all the HR stuff. So both Business Sweden and Nordic Innovation House has been of huge, huge help here. What I think is important for us is that, of course, I didn't want to leave Sweden, go to Singapore and just be around Swedish companies and Swedish people. Uh, but what I found was really, really good is that we needed a partner that has deep expertise of Southeast Asia and Singapore, for example, uh, but also understand Swedish needs and how we do business in Sweden. That has helped a lot. And the same goes with Nordic Innovation House especially on the networking front there, have been huge help here in Singapore. Uh, that's actually all I had to present, but I saw that I got some questions. Should I address them now or uh, do we take those afterwards? Uh, all right, I'll just answer the question then. But uh, uh, yes, we have to have a local director here and there's uh, services for that. Uh, so when we set up our company here, we also hired a local director to uh, to co co direct with me, if you can say that. Yeah. Uh, and we are a private limited company here. Yeah. Hope that answers your question. 
Yeah, Johan, thank you so much for the uh, presentation. Perfect. Thank you. Yes. So right now we'll move on to Japan. Uh, and the, we have uh, uh, Mr. Ito Yoshihiko from Japan External Trade Organization. Uh, Yoto-san, uh, when you're ready, feel free to start. Yeah, great. Thank you for your introduction. And hello, everybody. I'm Yoshihiko Ito, Director of Investment Team, uh, Digital London. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to speak here today. And I'd like to talk about attractive market opportunities and collaboration opportunities in Japan. Okay, let me share the slide. Okay, can you see my slide? Yes. Okay. Okay, we JETRO is a Japanese government organization which promotes trade and investment between Japan and other countries with more than 70 overseas offices and about 50 domestic offices. One of JETRO's current core mission is to attract prominent or promising foreign startups and innovative companies to Japan, as well as to support their collaboration with Japanese corporates. Today, I'd like to talk about these topics. And first, I'd like to briefly touch upon the current COVID-19 situation in Japan. Japan has maintained one of the lowest infection and mortality rates among major countries. However, currently, the number of infected people has increased since mid-March, and we are now facing the fourth wave. On the other hand, vaccination is behind that of Europe and the US with a cumulative total of approximately 1.3 million people having received one dose of vaccine. In light of these situations, uh, foreign nationals are not allowed to enter Japan as present due to border control, but international business, international business activities are actively carried out using online tools. Okay, let's move to the main topic today. And the amount investment in Japanese startups during 2020 is recorded as being around 4.3 billion US dollars. This is about 10% down from last year, but it has grown 2.8 times, times over the last five years. The chart on the right shows the top five sectors of investment in 2020. Japan, like the rest of the world, has seen a rapid increase in interest and demand for clean tech, with the sector moving up to fourth place. And the sharing economy has also risen to the list, driven by the momentum towards a new normal generated by COVID-19. Okay. In the robust Japanese startup investment landscape, general business companies are playing an important role. Startup, in, startup investment from general business companies has increased and accounted for around 30% of total investment in 2020. Why is there, there are so much investment by general business companies in Japan? This table shows how the sales of the top 10 listed companies in Japan and the US have changed in the pandemic. As you can see, in the US, tech giants such as GAFA saw a significant increase in sales. In Japan, on the other hand, the strong Japanese manufacturing companies such as Toyota, Hitachi, and Honda also declined. Entertainment companies such as Sony and Nintendo have increased their sales, but still not as much as in the US. In other words, as the pandemic accelerates a transition to a new normal across the world, the big Japanese companies who are the winners of the old economy needed to transform their business models more rapidly. And in order to achieve this, collaboration with startups is startups is becoming very important. Next, let me tell you about the attractive market and business environment in Japan. Japan has the third largest market and 11th largest population in the world. 
with a mature market, political stability, and well-developed business law system, Japan offers long-term stable business prospects for foreign companies. In addition, we are industrially and academically competitive. The number of companies listed in the Fortune Global 500 is the third largest in the world. The number of Nobel Prize winners in the natural science in the 21st century is second largest in the world. Also, Japan's Fugaku gained the title as world's fastest supercomputer in 2020. This showed that there are many business partners, talents, and technologies in Japan that can create and provide innovative products or new values in Japan and beyond. While most people think that the Japanese business should start in Tokyo, but we have recently seen an increase in the foreign startups starting their business in rural areas of Japan. Here are some examples we have supported. Cell Inc., a Swedish company specializing in 3D bioprinting, established its first business office in Kyoto in February 2020. Kyoto is famous as a tourist city with many historical buildings, but it is also a center of advanced medical technology, such as regenerative medicine. From Kyoto, they are working on R&D as well as customer support. Like these examples shown on the slide, Japan offers a variety of locations from large cities to medium-sized town and from cold climates similar to Northern Europe to warm climates like in Mediterranean. So there are many options depend on business and work style you prefer. Also, I'd like to touch on some of the main social issues in Japan. The first is declining birth rate and aging population. Japan has the highest aging rate in the world, reaching 28.7%. The shortage of labor in the nursing and medical sectors and increase in healthcare costs will become an even greater problem in the future. Likewise, in other industrial sectors, there will also be a shortage of labor, a shortage of successors, and also it becomes difficult to pass on the skills of veteran engineers who were the backbone of Japan's technological strengths. Secondly, carbon neutrality. This is now a global issue. The Japanese government has announced that the country will be carbon neutral by 2050. To achieve this, the government has set targets in 14 sectors and plans to invest around 18 billion US dollars in R&D for carbon neutrality. Thirdly, disaster prevention. Japan is one of the most natural disaster prone areas in the world. Typhoons and heavy rains occur every year, and huge earthquakes, tsunamis, and volcanic eruptions occur every few decades or centuries. 10 years after the Great East Japan earthquake, there are still many challenges to be overcome in the reconstruction of the affected areas and the decommissioning of the Fukushima nuclear power plant. We welcome the cooperation of foreign companies that can contribute to these challenges. Finally, I introduced the bilateral support. JETRA provides individual support for foreign companies looking to establish business in Japan. We have a wide range of support. When it comes to market research, we can produce a personalized report, research relevant regulations, as well as provide consultation from in-house and external specialists. If you wish to set up a physical office in Japan, we provide consultation on corporate structure, visas, taxation, and so on. Temporary offices can also be provided in several cities in Japan. We also help you find a partner in Japan. Depending on the needs of the company, we try to arrange one-on-one -on -one meeting with the potential partners. Our activities are totally funded by Japanese government, and there is a screening process to take our support, but all support can be taken for free of charge. 
If you are interested in working with us, please feel free to contact us. Thank you for your time and attention. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, uh, you too, Sang. We have actually a question for you. So one of the audience asked regarding the upcoming Olympic Games, what are the immediate business opportunity you think uh, uh, the Nordic startups should be taking advantage of? Yeah, it's a good question and yeah, a little bit sensitive question. You might know the Olympics Games, the uh, Japanese government were not allowed to invite foreign tourists. So it uh, will be a small event uh, comparing to a past Olympic Games. So yeah, but it is important to uh, prevent the uh, expand of infection uh, during the Olympic game. So this kind of uh, technology or service will be uh, welcome. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, now we'll move on to uh, Nicholas Kavanagh from Nordic Innovation House in Tokyo. Perfect, uh, yes, uh, thank yeah, you so Nicholas, much. Yeah, Nicholas, welcome. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you, Ito-san, uh, for your wonderful presentation and, and good to see you again. Uh, so my name is Niklas Karonen. I'm the community director at uh, Nordic Innovation House here in Tokyo. And let me share my screen. Here we go. All right, uh, some of the content is uh, actually quite similar to Ito-san's as well. So I'm happy that we're talking about the same things as, and also you already heard from my colleague Ben in Hong Kong, a little bit about the Nordic Innovation House structure. So I will not uh, focus on that too much. Um, but just to recap, uh, Scale the Best of the Nordics is our mission. We have five locations, Silicon Valley, New York, Singapore, Hong Kong, and Tokyo is actually the youngest of our family started in May, uh, 2020. And um, we are supported by the Nordic Trade Promotion Offices, as well as a Nordic Innovation headquartered in Oslo. And our services are targeted for Nordic startups and, and growth companies within the tech field. And here in Tokyo, uh, we are represented uh, by these organizations uh, from Sweden. We have Business Sweden and uh, the head of Business Sweden, Karsten Grönblad, is uh, sitting on, on my board. Personally, I lived in Japan for about uh, four years, I'm always involved in, in the startup scene, whether it's events like uh, Slush Asia or working for uh, local startups. Uh, but let me recap very quickly about the Japan ecosystem landscape. Uh, Ito-san already very nicely covered this, but I would like to highlight that Japan ranks somewhere between 5 to 20 in different types of global competitiveness um, indexes. And uh, in 2020, um, Tokyo was for the first time in the Genome Global Startup Ecosystem Report mentioned and already at the uh, 15th uh, location. It's also a very safe and a very stable country, and it is still the third largest economy in the world. Here in Nordic Innovation House Tokyo, we cover uh, the whole of Japan, so not just Tokyo. And um, as already mentioned, the startup ecosystem has been growing here. You can see quite a nice uh, yearly growth from 2012 onwards. If we look at the total sizes of the investments compared to the size of the country, um, it, it is still relatively low compared to, for example, the United States. But nevertheless, there is a strong positive trend. And the Japanese uh, government is also putting a lot of effort into creating what they call a global startup ecosystem cities, uh, some of which, which are listed here. Tokyo, of course, uh, the largest one. Osaka, looking very much into World Expo 2025 as well and Fukuoka, which is located in the southern part of uh, Japan. They have been very active, for example, with the startup visa program. Some of the fields where Japanese large organizations are looking for foreign uh, startups and innovations um, include deep tech, such as batteries, connected cards, VR, AR, mobility, wearable, uh, clean tech, as was also mentioned, uh, but also fields such as digital health and smart cities. Uh, this is from Innovation Leaders Summit Report 2019, uh, which is the largest open innovation event in Japan. It happened in March this year, and we nominated around uh, 20 Nordic companies to be part of it. We're also very happy to see that investments uh, from Japan to the Nordic startups um, have been growing. And uh, you can see from this slide a little bit more about the details. Uh, this is actually all publicly available information uh, by Innovation Lab Asia. So if you go to innovationlabasia.dk, uh, they are our partners and you can find all of this information. 
um, as well. Uh, of course, we had COVID, so that cut down the investments a little bit, but still we had around 15 cases which were publicly available information last year. Uh, from Sweden, uh, we have uh, Crosser, the edge data analysis company invested by NTT Docomo, uh, Fishbrain, which is a sport fishing app invested by SoftBank. Uh, we can also highlight uh, Voy, which is a Swedish electric scooter company. Here, this is invested by Nordic Ninja VC, which is a very interesting VC located um, in Helsinki. However, it is cooperation with the Japan Bank for International Cooperation and their LPs include um, Panasonic, Honda and others, and they only focus on Nordic and Baltic companies. So there's a lot of interest towards Nordic tech and Nordic innovations and the Nordic brand um, here in Japan as well is, is very strong. I wanted to highlight a couple of recent Nordic startup entries, but it also already beat me to it. I also had selling on my list as well as uh, Vault. Uh, but perhaps I can also highlight here uh, Mass Global, a Finnish uh, mobility as a service company. Uh, they are currently doing a POC with a municipality. And then Nightingale Health, which is a Finnish um, health tech company, entered into Japan with the help of Kiring and, and Mitsui. Uh, all of these examples have something in common, which is that they have uh, strong Japanese partners. Um, but many of them did not start from Tokyo. So it's good to keep in mind that Japan is, is quite a big country and a lot of the local municipalities are putting effort into attracting foreign talent and foreign companies. So you might be able to start and test the markets outside of Tokyo as well. Uh, but happy to talk in details about uh, any of these entries if you are interested. A little bit about the Nordic Innovation House and what we do uh, for Nordic companies typically past the initial startup stage. So for our Japanese stakeholders, they tend to like to see a proven business model or services or products. Um, of course, there is um, some case by case situations, but typically that's the, scale, that's the case. And for companies who are looking into expanding um, or exploring the Japanese market. Our membership offering is pretty similar across our locations. Um, I won't go through all of it. Please do contact if you are interested. Uh, but typically access to different types of networks is what the companies see the most valuable, whether it's uh, governmental agencies, um, and industry technology matchmaking events, uh, help with visa or work permits, or access to trusted service providers or mentors. Uh, we can cover that. We do a lot of different types of Nordic events together with the trade promotion offices. Um, just yesterday, we did um, an event about Nordic fintech. Uh, we actually had a representative from Greater Than uh, participating as well. So great to see you here too. And then uh, on the community access, uh, what I would like to highlight is that we work as a resource center for any types of challenges, accelerators, incubator programs. So if we think that our member companies should be part of these programs, we make sure that they know about them and that they are in the best position to apply. And um, in some cases, we can also directly connect them uh, to the service provider to make sure that their application uh, get uh, the attention that it deserves. On the visibility side, we have, of course, our own channels and, and sometimes local newsletters and media outlets uh, reach out to us. And we try to, of course, uh, get our member companies into these publications. And it is about a thousand um, Swedish kroner per month. Uh, this is also uh, similar with our Asian locations. I wanted to highlight a couple of our focus areas. So all the Nordic innovation houses, we are industry agnostic, which means that if you're a tech company, we're more than happy to, to have you as our members and, and discuss further. But here in Japan, we have figured out that there are a couple of areas where we should put more effort into. We know that we have skills and innovations in the Nordics, and we know that Japan is looking for them. And this is also reflecting quite a bit of Ito-san's presentation as well. Digital health um, obviously accelerated through COVID and COVID has really brought up a lot of the challenges in Japan regarding digitalization as a whole. And there is a big, big movement going on uh, in, in multiple industries, but digital health included. We have similar challenges in the Nordics, uh, such as uh, aging population, rising medical costs, and, and it has to be digitalized and there needs to be new innovations around this field. And we've also seen some softenings in the Japanese legislative environment regarding telehealth and digital therapeutics. 
Uh, actually, together with uh, Business Sweden and Innovation Norway here in Japan, we are publishing uh, digital health market opportunities from Japan report. Uh, this will be available, I think, within a month's time. Uh, so if you're a digital health company, please do give us a follow or reach out and we can make sure that you get that report, which is um, free of charge. Uh, clean tech, um, as mentioned, Japan aims to be carbon neutral by 2050. And uh, there was also a, a green growth strategy report by the Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry, which had these 12 different fields. And the ones that we have underlined here, energy transformation, decarbonized energy, as well as transportation, and particularly maritime. Uh, these are the fields that we think that Nordics have advantage and that we will be uh, focusing more moving onwards. And digital transformation is our third theme. This is an overarching uh, theme. Uh, but um, in many of the Nordic countries, we have something called a digital agency within the ministries. Uh, Japan doesn't have that yet, but it will have that during this year. So we are following this discussion uh, very closely and they are actually benchmarking in many areas to what we are doing um, in the Nordics. So digital transformation or DX as it's coined here is, is one of our focus areas. And what these focus areas means is that we will create more events, more programs, and hopefully also physical delegations down the line uh, when the borders open again. But if you are a company within any of these fields, um, definitely uh, please feel free to reach out and we can see what we can help through the Nordic Innovation House or the Nordic Trade Promotion Offices. These are just some of the events that we did last year. Uh, one, for example, together with uh, Jetro, we introduced seven Nordic digital transformation companies to our uh, Japanese audience. Our events are either in English or in Japanese or in both languages. Uh, I think that the next presentation will likely also touch a little bit on, on, on the cultural side of things and how to manage uh, your localization procedures um, here in Japan. But things are also uh, moving forward on that front as well. And these are some of our partners, uh, both in Japan and in the Nordics. And last thing that I wanted to share with you is, is a couple of active opportunities from Japan that Nordic companies uh, could apply to. Uh, one is the Open Network Lab. This is a seed accelerator program. I dare to say this is one of the first globally oriented acceleration programs in Japan. This is their 23rd batch. Uh, we have had one, for example, Danish company participating before and they received um, investments after, after uh, completing this program and they're currently doing market entry in Japan. So this is something that we feel like we can recommend as well as the Enec Change. This is um, energy sector um, acceleration program. Uh, both uh, deadlines are April 30th, uh, so if you are interested, uh, please uh, reach out to us to hear more details or check the website and make sure that you apply before April uh, 30th. And this is my contact information. Feel free to be in touch uh, with any inquiries regarding Japan, regarding our services, opportunities for startups. We also have a local community manager supporting us and all the social medias. Uh, where we will post all the upcoming deadlines to any of our own programs or uh, programs from, from our partners uh, or other organizations. Uh, but with that, I would like to conclude my presentation. Uh, thank you so much uh, for having me and uh, happy to answer any questions uh, here today or we can take it through email or LinkedIn or, or whatnot. Uh, but thank you so much for having me. Yeah, thank you so much, Nicholas. Um, we will move on to Stefan Sandstrom. Um, are you with us, Stefan? So I'm with you. And it was nice hearing your voice again, Niklas. You know why? Uh, I will start my... Yeah. Hopefully... We can see my screen. Yes, we can see it. Perfect. Okay, so I'm a business consultant in Japan, originally from Spain. This is what I look like when I'm very sweaty in the August heat of Japan. So I come from the medical and chemical engineering background, coupled with the lifelong entrepreneurship. I'm from Umeo, I was by Kilimo. And um, I live in Tokyo since 2007. Uh, Stefan, sorry to interrupt, um, but can you guys hear Stefan clearly? 
Yes, if I'm clear. Yeah, please continue. Um, if it'd be great if you're closer to the mic. I'm sorry, I don't have. <laughs> uh, to the computer. Oh, yeah. But please um, go ahead. So let's. I will try to speak a little louder. Maybe. If yeah. Harry's so, uh, so this picture is outside of the Imperial Palace in central Tokyo. I. Before COVID hit us, I used to go there every week and practice with the We are also the, the many so the professional police officers and professional kendo players and also part of the, the imperial family's bodyguard. That's interesting. So I started in Sweden. I set up several companies. I exited two. I crashed two. And um, I learned so much from uh, doing things. And uh, I am currently working as a master, a very active board member in some companies, and a business coach. And I do pro bono work one week, and today is this week. Okay. <laughs> so, welcome to that. I practice Kendo, and uh, just say that it has been a lifelong preoccupancy for me. It's the full contact martial art to a lot of places. Uh, some people like it, I think it's tremendous fun. Very soft call or anything, but uh, Kendo has really opened up the hand to me. And it has also fostered me into being completely unafraid of. Absolutely everything. And before we start, or before I start, I would like to share my most immature and self indulgent egoistic silliness. And that's after the practice of the Imperial Palace, I allow myself to walk very slowly when I leave, and I leave the palace around lunchtime. So uh, there are always a lot of tourists around. And as I exit, sometimes so the tourists will go to the guards and guard the exit and say, oh, hey, we want to ex enter the palace to do it. No, we cannot. But why? He could enter. Uh, but he's a special guest. That feeds my ego in a very silly way, but I allow it. It's, it's my guilty pleasure. So let's start. Uh, as a business consultant here in Tokyo, I work with the uh, Almost any type of company, from scale ups to 14,500 companies. Uh, we also have a lot of the best organizations, partners, providers, AOLs that our clients need. And uh, I mean, it saves a lot of time when you come to Japan because you don't need to look for these people and do the due diligence. So with numbers of the plan, we have been ready to say. Uh, what I to highlight and underline is that the, the, if you get acceptance in the Japanese marketplace for your product, it, it automatically gives you access to Southeast Asia. your product is here. Uh, of course, nothing happens by itself, but uh, it's much easier to come from Japan to Vietnam than to do the other round. So, when it's time to enter Japan, or you think that it would be a good idea, or you want to enter Japan, you have to ask yourself the question. Do you have the resources to do it, to get from where we are today to break even and beyond? The answer is, you know, yes, or not yet, but <laughs> you do. And uh, there are some things you can do. So if you are not yet funded enough or have enough people, you can still visit the trade show, you can come to the invitation, you can come and visit me at my office in Hyde Park, uh, JETCO, uh, MIA, with Nicholas, and Business Student are also ready to help. Uh, there are several EU. 
I think like almost 2,000 companies come to Japan and do whatever they want to do. So, but whatever your flavor, remember to do your homework. Otherwise, it will not be worth time responding. So, if the answer is yes, you have the resources it takes to get you all the way to profitable presence in Japan. So, you kind of need to only figure out where you are in the world. I mean, from getting to understand the market to increase your profit. And uh, there are many people that would like to help you and unhelp you. Because success in Japan basically boils down to two things. You don't have people here, so it would be very, very difficult. And I would say that uh, all the companies I have met with that have failed in Japan, uh, they have the thing in common that they did not do their homework and they don't have both things. It's an extremely difficult situation for you that that's impossible to come over, overcome. So, I will conclude with small case studies that are examples of the work I do. I have this focus on med tech, life science, and biotech. Med tech would be 90% of it. And it's European companies that I have. And this is a very interesting project, Hydraulic Analysis Group. It's a British company to work with the uh, smart pipe. And in pipe on uh, gas, oil, or water. And uh, I set them up with Yokogawa, which is one of the world's largest companies when it comes to automation. Yawa Water, and Mexico, and Yokogawa Pharmaceutical, and some other. And we are working together with a huge project in India. So that's uh, probably one of the biggest projects we've ever involved with. Uh, so I've also worked in the nuclear decommissioning industry. And the uh, uh, it's a Bulgarian company. We have a very clever long term storage solution for low and medium grade uh, nuclear weapons. After two years in Japan, uh, the conclusions were after meeting with PEPCO, suppliers, uh, government, including the Ministry of Minister of Environment. That there was not going to be business for Bible. That was difficult to speak my but those things happen. And I always try to get to the no, when this was no, to let you could possibly get to it. This is a possible outcome. So that we and my third. Case is uh, creating a strategic partnership with uh, Japan's Bio Industry Association, the British company called Bioforum. So, Bioforum, they organize the biomanufacturing industry, including the suppliers, and all the way to the clinic. Doesn't say much to people who know. But kind of a quote. And they work with the uh, the leading companies of the world in this industry, major pharmaceutical and the major chemical companies, and some of them. They have been working in Japan for a little over one year now, trying to get Japanese companies to be members in Bioflow. Because it's a, they call themselves a membership. A membership company. So you get a membership and you get to work with uh, all the other experts in your field, the other company. And they set up collaboration between non 
competitive areas and three competitive areas in the world. That's why we used to one of them, setting up best practices to be defined. And uh, they concluded that uh, working together with the JDA and Japan, which is all the major Japanese companies, and they thought that it would be great. Because we would get access to all the members and send our faces to them and all the good. Uh, the JDA never before had partnership with the company. They, they have a partnership with Medicon Valley in South Sweden and North. And they work with that organization. But through some cleverness, uh, I managed to get an MOU up and running within one year. So it's great achievement. And uh, I will conclude with that, saying that, uh, yes, I get things done. Uh, if you're interested in Japan in any way, you have to have the questions regarding Japan and your business here. Please uh, take a screen down to this, or remember my question, contact me. And with that, I say thank you very much. My next yeah. contact. Stop yeah, thank you so much for uh, Stefan for sharing with us uh, all these interesting case studies. Uh, I'm sorry to the audience if the sound quality is not the best. Uh, now that uh, we are in the uh, final point of our uh, webinar, uh, we'd like to wrap up the session and I'd like to address to, the, uh, to our expert panelist. Uh, one thing we'd like to touch upon are some of the common mistakes that you have seen companies uh, when they enter into Asian market. Maybe we can start with uh, Hong Kong. Uh, Bing, do you have uh, some uh, uh, anything to share with uh, the Nordic companies, like some of the common mistakes they should be aware of? I'm echoing what one uh, Yining said. Um, you have to. Uh, we always have this question when I'm um, listening into pitching sessions and uh, pitching competitions. Like I, I will always ask why Hong Kong and why China. So for the companies who is interested to join China, you know, it's, uh, I mean, most of the market entry is very complex and China for now it's extremely complicated. And uh, so you have to have in mind, are you selling a product or are you here to getting investors uh, investment? So like, make sure you know what you want and uh, how much, how big is your team? Can you really, um, um, you really have to think of localizing it to find a local partner sooner or later to help you out. Uh, so uh, I think that the yinning sharing, it was really, really good. Have that in mind when you come to um, uh, the Greater Bay Area and the rest of China. Hong Kong is easy though. Hong Kong is very easy. If we speak English, everyone speaks English here. And uh, that's why I'm saying, I'm taking you to Greater Bay Area by landing you in Hong Kong first. That's my take. Well, <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you, Bing. What about the, uh, for the Singapore market? Uh, Marcus, what are the, some common mistakes uh, Nordic startups should be aware of? Uh, uh, Johan, um, do you have anything to add? Okay, then yes, then we will move on to um, the, the, the Tokyo uh, market. Uh, Niklas, do you have anything to add regarding some of the, uh, the no things that the Nordic company should be aware of? Yes, uh, thank you for the question. I think it's, it's a really yeah. good question, echoing also Ben's, Ben's thoughts on why, why Japan and making sure that you have the correct understanding of, of the local information, um, especially in Japan, the latest information tends to be in Japanese. And what you find from the internet is not necessarily reflecting the current state of the market. And then another thing that I would highlight is that uh, don't marry the first person that you meet and make sure that you um, do your homework in terms of the partners, because it can be very difficult to, first of all, get out of a partnership and second, to find new partners. Um, this is the case that we often see, uh, perhaps a little bit more on, on import export type of businesses. But if you go with the wrong agency, it can be very difficult to find new agencies to work with you. So just be very careful um, who you who you marry yourself to would be my my um, take on this. Yeah, thank you so much for all the expert panelists to join our discussion today. Um, to summarize the key takeaway, first of all, uh, having a great partners, which is always very important. 
Second of all, have a clear understanding why do you want to go to specific region in Asia? And the third, have a unique uh, value proposition uh, when it comes to expand your business in Asia. Um, and thank you so much for uh, all of you guys joining us today. And the, for all the startups that are still with us, you know, uh, Nordic Innovation House, Business Sweden, Invest in Hong Kong, uh, they are all great uh, agencies that can assist you when it comes to expand your business in Asia. Um, feel free to reach out to them and the, you have all their contact information. Um, I'm sure they will be very happy to guide you through um, your global ex uh, expansion strategies. Thank you so much, guys, for being with us today.